Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 31st of October 2018, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish. And there's only one subject, and that's war. Absolutely. So uh, here we go. Trident Juncture, NATO's uh, biggest exercise since the Cold War. 50,000 troops, 250 aircraft, 65 ships, 10,000 vehicles in war games of potential conflict with Russia. So this is... Uh, the scenario is fascinating, Brian. The scenario is uh, a fictional near peer adversary on the northeastern flank of the alliance. So um, the only one that I can think of is Russia. Uh, it's mostly based in Norway and in the uh, seas around Norway and also in the airspace. Uh, and uh, Canada, the United States, states taking part. Now today they've got 150 aircraft, 65 ships, 10,000 vehicles uh, deployed for a live exercise. Uh, that's going on for the next few days uh, and uh, Finland and Sweden are taking part in that as well they're not member NATO members uh, now most of NATO's war games uh, as I say taking place in central Norway uh, but some operations NATO says are scheduled to take place on the coast and in the Norwegian Sea uh, well very near where Russia has significant naval forces but perhaps more naval forces uh, than they had originally planned. So let's have a look at what Jens Stoltenberg uh, was saying about this uh, at the press conference yesterday. This is a defensive exercise. NATO is a defensive uh, alliance and uh, all nations have the right to exercise their own forces. And we are exercising on NATO territory in Norway and we exercise with our close partners, uh, uh, Finland and, uh, and uh, Sweden. Um, we are transparent about what we do. This is a long time, uh, long planned, long time planned exercise. And we have also used the NATO Russia Council to brief Russia on the exercise. Uh, and we have invited observers uh, from the OSCE to observe the exercise. They can talk to the soldiers, the troops participating in the exercise. They can conduct overflights and they will also be briefed on the scenario of the exercise. NATO always invites uh, observers to our uh, uh, exercises. Russia has uh, not invited international observers to any exercise since the end of the Cold War. We are transpar uh, tran transparent and we inform them about uh, our exercises and invite them to uh, observe them. So uh, this is uh, a necessary uh, exercise to make sure that NATO continues to provide credible deterrence and the reason why we do that is to prevent a conflict, of course, not to provoke a conflict. Uh, we were notified last week about uh, the uh, planned uh, Russian uh, missile test um, uh, outside the coast here, uh, out of Mörö uh, uh, Russia has significant uh, forces, uh, naval forces, uh, uh, in this area. They are. Uh, they are uh, regularly uh, exercising their naval capabilities, maritime uh, uh, capabilities, uh, uh, off the coast of uh, Norway. Uh, I expect uh, Russia to behave uh, in a professional uh, way, and uh, it will not change the plans of our uh, exercise. We will, of course, monitor closely what Russia does, uh, but uh, they operate in international waters, and they have notified us in the uh, normal way. So, Brian, a fictional peer, near peer adversary in the northeastern flank of the alliance. The only conclusion that Russia could come to there is that it's them that's being uh, targeted. Uh, targeted in this yeah. exercise. So they've now decided to hold this, uh, this, this missile test uh, off the coast of Norway uh, in international waters. Uh, it's hardly surprising uh, that they may feel the need to make a point. Uh, well, I, I think this is one of the things, uh, Mike, that maybe a lot of people don't consider um, when they're thinking through what NATO is uh, doing. But the fact that these exercises are effectively held right up to the Russian borders. If we imagine that the Russians with some allies um, came down through the Norwegian Sea and uh, started practicing landings, adjacent to Scotland, we might have a completely different view as to whether that exercise was transparent and non-threatening or not. 
but in a time when, when we can see tension ramping up, being ramped up, as we're going to show, I think, later in the news, um, the only thing this exercise can be doing is ramping up the tension. So it's not surprising the Russians have responded. Mm. Um, uh, just a, a comment on um, his, Mr. Stoltenberg's dress there. Um, was that carefully selected? So against that backdrop, it almost appeared as though he'd got semi-combat gear on. He wasn't there in a shirt and tie, which would have rather stood out. He would have been the politician who, of course, is not going to go any near, anywhere near the combat. He is uh, attempting to make it look as though he's a little bit of an action man and he's part of the game. I, I may be cynical on that. But... Well, well, yeah, OK, but uh, the... Uh... The Norwegian Prime Minister was there as well, uh, and he was wearing a woolly jumper too. So oh, I think was this it? was uh, some kind of uh, dressing but, down. But day. this was a, a white and a white and grey number. So perhaps this was <laughs> yes, yeah, dressing down day indeed. Okay, well, can we trust what we're being shown on uh, by the media and indeed uh, the British government when it comes to matters of defence? I'm going to say a big thank you to one of our viewers that sent us through uh, another of the fine Commons Library briefings. And uh, we did a little bit of research work on this document, as we will now show you. Let's see what they have to say. So this is the document itself, House of Commons Library, briefing paper, 30th of October 2018, Russian Intelligence Services and Special Forces. And I'll just say that the excellent picture of the camouflage man on the front has, has come from the Russians themselves, so they're not shy of using a little bit of uh, Russian... Uh, photographic expertise. Um, these are the contents. Um, KGB, Reborn, GRU, Spetsnaz, what's new? Well, there's nothing new in this document because essentially what it's doing is regurgitating everything that the government wants us to hear and believe. So um, what we should say is the Russians are coming. Uh, the author is a gentleman called Ben Smith. Um, but the real question is, who is Ben Smith? Because if we start to say, well, who is this man? What is his expertise to be making these statements about the Russians and the Russian military, the Russian security services? Um, we can't really find anything. If you go to the Commons Library website, you will find that there's quite a lot of glossy information, but they don't seem to want to declare who their researchers are. And they certainly don't want to declare who Mr. Ben Smith is. Now, if you're not aware of the House of Commons Library, um, have a look on their web page. Always check uh, what news sources have to say, including the UK column. Uh, this is what you'll find. So they're celebrating 200 years of the House of Commons Library. Um, now, the important thing, and you'll recognise these words, of course, Mike, the House of Commons Library is an independent research and information service. Uh, we give politically impartial briefings to MPs. So presumably they just took it on upon themselves that one of the things they should be focusing on is uh, Russia and they've produced this briefing, totally impartial, no political spin in it at all. Um, well, let's have a look at the little embedded video to get a full feel of how impartial this organization is. I just want clear factual information on what's happening in the world you can get the latest analysis of the most important topics coming from a resource that is entirely impartial, expertly researched and totally free. Why is it free? It belongs to you. It's the online research of the House of Commons Library. Now forget any library that you have ever seen. The Commons Library is actually made up of small teams of experts critically separate from the world of politics. Their job is to gather information from trusted sources and collate it into unprejudiced research and analysis. This research is then published for members of parliament to help them do their jobs. And because of this, that information has to be top grade, and it's there for you to read as well. Our experts specialise in a massive range of topics and come from lots of different backgrounds, such as engineering, housing, medicine, climate science and transport. As well as these specialists, the library also has statisticians, economists, lawyers, scientists and doctors, and they write reports on a multitude of subject areas close to all our hearts. Because they do all this work for all MPs of all parties, library reports are always politically impartial. They have to be. 
which means you can use them to get an in-depth understanding of subjects you're interested in, and you can be confident that they've been rigorously fact-checked. And if Hold you... on. Oh, more to come. Beg your pardon. Oh, go ahead. Oh, it's there? Yeah. OK, well, <laughs> um, stunning piece of video. Um, many people have already commented childish in its, uh, in its style. Uh, which I would agree with. Um, but what did we get out of it? That this whole service belongs to us, the people. We need these people to check the facts for us. They are unprejudiced and they're separate from the world of politics. It's free. And it's free. I don't think so. Well, apart from the fact we pay for it. But let's, um, let's just delve into it a little bit more. And uh, here's the key lady. Uh, running it. She is the Librarian and Director General of Participation Research and Information at the House of Commons, Penny Young. Uh, she has this to say, good quality data and analysis is essential to supporting a thriving parliamentary democracy. Research from the Commons Library helps MPs make informed decisions. So the better the information base for our research, the better informed these decisions will be. Now let's remember that this paper is to do with the Russians. We're told the Russians are coming to murder us in our beds. And we're told by Penny Young that politicians need to read her research, otherwise they won't be well informed and they can't make good decisions. Mm. Um, so we can follow this through a little bit more. This is, um, uh, this is a bit more information which you can read through on the Parliament uh, uh, website itself. Uh, most of it to, is to do with um, how they do things and how uh, independent they are. Uh, but what caught my eye as we scrolled down was that in this particular thing they're involved in, it says that if you've got examples of data and analysis gaps in any of these areas, crime, education, global challenges, health, housing, immigration, trade and globalisation, work and welfare, um, then you should email need to know at fullfact.org. Now, I've no doubt that uh, many of you will pick up on full fact. I found it interesting because, of course, we're following through an independent uh, Commons library. So where does this little trail uh, take us? Uh, well, here's a little bit more House of Commons library to take part in need to know. Uh, sometimes it's surprising how hard it can be to find answers to simple questions. As an adult, it can be very hard because you need somebody, a teacher, uh, I think. Sometimes it's surprising how hard it can be. The House of Commons Library is partnering with Full Fact, the Economic and Social Research Council and UK Statistics Authority to launch Need to Know, a plan for filling the gaps in publicly available data and analysis. So we are well, we are adults, but we can't quite work it out for ourselves. So we need a help of a little cartoon and we need an independent, impartial Commons Library to help us understand what's going on in the world. Just keep remembering that's what they're telling us. So um, if you're not sure about full fact, um, articles on UK Column website about this uh, organisation, which we've looked at many times before. Um, but what is fascinating is that the moment we come into full fact, we, we find everything that's not impartial. So we've got uh, the Honourable Michael Samuel, and uh, you'll see that aside from his wider experience as uh, chairman of the Anna Freud Centre, um, he's also been a Conservative Party donor. That's impartial, but that's he's, independent. Well, I'd, I didn't want any of our viewers or listeners might to be confused about what impartiality means. But full fact is clearly impartial. Uh, House of Commons Library is partnering with it. That's impartial. So this is all impartial, which is very good. Um, who else have we got here? Well, we've got people from universities. Uh, we've got Baroness Neuberger, a Liberal Democrat. This is to try and show that it's spread across parties, mm -hmm. but it's independent and impartial. Um, and um, we've got Lord Sharkey there, Liberal Democrat peer. Um, he ah, was, so two Lib Dems and one Tory, is that Well, it? they're spread around a bit, but he was managing director of Saatchi and Saatchi, and he was um, advising Nick Clegg's um, team on the party's 2010 general election campaign. So no involvement in politics at all. 
And uh, just to make sure there's no misunderstanding, we've got former Conservative MEPs here and chairman of CN Group, a publisher of local newspapers across the north of England. So this is all um, unprejudiced, it's impartial and uh, tied in with the Commons Library. Um, so let's look at this report itself, uh, which Ben Smith has put together. And the summary comes first. And this is the opening line, therefore, of the report. The Salisbury incident and its aftermath brought the Russian secret services into the spotlight. Malcolm Chalmers of the Royal United Services Institute said Russian security services were going well beyond normal spying practice by launching disruptive operations that threaten life in target societies. They blur the line between war and peace. Um, so this is hearsay, effectively, from... Uh, the Royal United Services Institute. And if you're not sure about Malcolm Chalmers and you have a look at his background, this man is a government advisor. He, he's got his, uh, his tentacles in everywhere. And you can simply say the man could not be fulfilling all the roles uh, he fulfills without the government liking what he has to say. Mm. So the Commons Library linking straight through to an individual who is actually part of the government's own machinery. But here we are, the Russians are coming. So how does Ben Smith get his information? Um, well, let's have a look at um, uh, the references is what we're really interested in because as he goes through these um, segments of the report, um, a big, it, it's, it's really a big thing that the references are at the bottom of the page. You notice that we're quickly into cyber warfare here, which of course the government is telling us is, is what those nasty Russians have been up to, interfering in elections, hacking into the NHS. Uh, we're to believe it because, well, here's the evidence. And what sort of sources do we get? Um, well, we've got a mixture really because um, uh, we've got the Jamestown Foundation. I'll show a little bit on them in a minute. But we also get to such excellent sources as Bellingcat there at the bottom, Mike. Excellent. So this is not exactly high-grade material. Voice of America. Um, a lot of stuff from the US intelligence uh, circuit woven together with this other material. Let's look at that Jamestown Foundation. Uh, based in Washington, D.C., uh, for research and analysis, founded in 1984 as a platform to support Soviet defectors. So this uh, will clearly have a pretty jaundiced view of, uh, of uh, Russia as a whole. This is a highly political organisation, but everything it produces uh, is impartial and correct. Um, so where does he go after that? Uh, well, it goes a little bit into foreign affairs material and a little bit into open democracy. Uh, so that's all impartial, of course. Um, and then we get into J Journal of Defence Management. So this is not really evidence. This is just articles that he's pulled apart. We've got the Financial Times and we've got the Independent. So now we're taking information circulating in newspapers we're crafting it together and we're presenting it back to MPs because they can't read those newspapers in the first place, Mike. I see. And then they will use that to form policy. And then they're forming policy. So we've got a U US Department of Justice one thrown in, but then we've got a Downing Street press release. So this is a closed loop. We're even using the government's own press material put back into an impartial document. Um, what else have we got there? We've got the National Cyber Security Centre press release. Well, that's government as well. And then we're into um, this sort of thing. So this is more pseudo, um, how do we describe it? Pseudo security organisations. We've got the Financial Times. Uh, we've got Jane's Intelligence Review. We've got the Financial Times. We've got the Financial Times, which yeah. is where you go for intelligence on the Russians, of course. Um, what have we got here? The Guardian, Financial Times, The Independent and uh, The Guardian. Um, Good so, stuff. So this is pretty impressive. And of course, this forms the baseline for the material that uh, our MPs read. So Ben Smith, we know, can read. He reads newspapers. He believes what they say. He then weaves it all together in a briefing which is given to our MPs 
because apparently they can't read those newspapers themselves. Um, this should be funny. Uh, I'm trying hard not to smile because really it is so pathetic. But of course, this is immensely dangerous because it shows us the, uh, the sheer ineptitude of Westminster as a war is ramped up with Russia. But let's come back to um, Penny Young. And we spoke uh, not to her, but we did speak to the organisation this morning. And this is effectively what they said. You can trust us because we're independent and impartial and everyone who works here has been selected for those qualities. And you don't need to know anything about the researchers because they're independent and impartial and they will only partner with organisations who are independent and impartial. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody's with me. And in any case, members of parliament use our services and you can trust their judgment. And I don't understand why you feel it's necessary to know anything about our researchers be it experience, knowledge, track record, education or affiliations. And at that point, we could say they were really suggesting that I was rather a nuisance and I should go away. But there we are. This is the quality of the briefing material given to our MPs. And of course, MPs being particularly lazy people are more likely to read these short, sharp, glossy briefings than they are to trawl through uh, more in-depth uh, material which is made available in Westminster. Um, we don't have to make this up. This is the reality of British Parliament at the moment. Um, just before you move on for that, I just thought I'd take one paragraph from the Wikipedia page on this, Brian, because I thought yeah. it was interesting. It says, in 2011, the library had 150 staff and occupied premises outside the Palace of Westminster uh, as well as within it. Many of the staff have specialist qualifications in, for instance, law, statistics, and various aspects of public affairs or librarianship. Staff of the library are not and have never been employed by the civil service. They serve and pr provide completely impartial advice and analysis to members of parliament. Now, uh, we all know what Wikipedia is and what it isn't, uh, but theoretically, uh, statements in Wikipedia are supposed to be cited uh, with evidence uh, there is no evidence for anything that's in that document. Uh, it does say that these people are not employed as civil servants. So what are they employed as? Who actually are they employed by? by and what and, background checks have been done? And, and who's funding it? So, so I assume it's funded by government, uh, but uh, that's not clear. And apparently at this point, we're not allowed to know. We're not allowed to know. So if any of our viewers and listeners can help us with... Uh, digging into the uh, Commons Library. Who are the researchers? Who runs them? What's the organisation? How are they paid? And how independent, you know, this is the key bit, how independent are these people that are effectively giving a pro-war briefing to MPs? Uh, we could do with some help. And uh, we'll remind people that this Saturday in Totnes, the Seven Stars Hotel, we are putting on the emergency defence and security briefing. We feel this is an emergency briefing uh, because despite all of the smokescreen and bluster of Brexit, it is clear that British military forces, the command and control structure, research and development, procurement, everything is being handed over to EU military unification. And we know that not only will MPs not talk about this, the parties will not talk about it. We are now seeing, surprisingly, that organisations such as Leave Means Leave will not talk about it. And uh, if you care to visit the Leave Mean Leave's website and look at the events page, you will discover that the Bolton talk is missing, all of their other conferences there. But the Bolton talk is not shown. That was the very uh, talk at which questions were asked about EU military unification from the floor. And it appears that's all been censored. Now, uh, one of the issues in recent weeks has been the question of uh, extremism. Uh, in fact, for quite a long time, since David Cameron's 2014 or 2015 uh, speech to the uh, UN General Assembly concerned about right wing extremism in particular, uh, the, the rhetoric continues to build. Uh, this is the Henry Jackson Society. Now, we all know what the Henry Jackson Society is and what it represents. Uh, so we take this with a pinch of salt. But however, uh, they have released a new report today called Terrorism in the West, an Age of Extremes. 
Uh, and they're saying that uh, in recent years, Britain has become the number one location for terrorism in the Western world. Uh, and well, let's just have a run through some of the, uh, the things that they say. They say uh, in 2017, 20.59% uh, of all attacks were perpetrated by the far right. Okay, so this is one thing that they have uh, discovered. Uh, something else they've discovered in 2017, 20.59% of all attacks were perpetrated by the far left. So there you go. We've got a far right and a far left building up here. And so that means that 41% of all attacks were perpetrated by either the far right or the far left. So, that, so uh, the point they're making is that although Islamic ex extremism and ex Islamic terrorism is still the worst, uh, that they're very quickly we're seeing the far right and the far left coming up behind it. Uh, and uh, well, what are we going to end up with then? Let's see what else they say. They say that, uh, they knew that a new pattern of far right offenders emulating or copying the tactics of high profile Islamic assailants is what we're beginning to see. Uh, and they're asking why is this happening and they're saying that this is because uh, of the fracturing of society, uh, of online radicalization uh, and uh, well no participation in democracy. Uh, they don't uh, ask why there's no participation in democracy, they don't ask why people are disaffected from the democratic process at the moment. They don't make any comment about the fact uh, that the uh, that the British and government and Western governments governments are pursuing uh, policies for which they really don't have any mandate uh, and uh, and certainly no buy-in from the public, uh, and so this is what seems to be the outcome from that: uh, the rise of uh, of far right extremism and far right violence, uh, but which seems to be matched very much by the rise of far left extremism and far left. Uh, violence. So we now seem to have this uh, three-way split in extremism between Islamic extremism and uh, uh, white extremism of various kinds. Like those statistics, 20.59% for both left, uh, left and right. Yes. That, that is amazing um, parity. Well, just, just to put a, an actual figure on that, that yeah. means 14 events from, from the both. far right and from the far left. So, right. So, so so you've got you've got a really difficult um, security climate. There's all sorts of people involved in stuff that you don't really know who they are. Our own security services admit they've got a problem, but then we can get out material which um, gives 14 events to both sides. I'm yes. asking a question here, really. This to me seems highly manipulated material, um, which is following an agenda, and I think that agenda is to help promote the unrest. Well, I completely agree with you, and, and to sort of back that up, uh, looking at the media coverage of this today, um, in their report themselves, they make it very clear that in their, the point that Islamic extremism and Islamic terrorism is still the biggest problem that we have. Right. They're saying that far right and far left extremism and terrorism is coming up behind. But when you look at the mainstream media coverage today, there was almost no discussion of the Islamic aspect of this and only uh, the far right aspect of this. There yeah. wasn't even much discussion in the mainstream press about the far left aspect of this and the fact that the far left and the far right uh, are, are uh, you know, uh, on parity in terms of uh, activity. So, um, so yes, I believe that's exactly what's going on. Interesting. Well, um, we won't, I don't think, be looking to Devon and Cornwall Police for help. Remember, it was only a few months ago that Devon and Cornwall, Cornwall Police were warning uh, people in Devon and Cornwall that uh, they thought ISIS may well attack um, holiday villages and sites inside the rural countryside. So against that background, we would have expected Devon and Cornwall Police to be really vigilant and highly professional um, but seems that they've got other things in mind and uh, just have a look at this uh, this is um, one of the police cars um, this is not a this is not a doctored image to amuse our audience uh, this is uh, what Devon and Cornwall police think is good use of public money um, in order to um, show their support for poppy appeal I, I think there's something rather deeper going on than just supporting the public. So I think that this is messing with the public mind. I think this is deliberate because essentially now what we've got is a cartoon car and a cartoon car equals cartoon police. Mm. So 
perhaps other uh, perhaps our viewers and listeners have got different uh, views on this but uh, something very strange going on here uh, meanwhile we just bring in this one which was sent through to us this morning by david scott it's a tweet by nicola sturgeon and she says that care experienced young people are inspirational and role models for us all and if you think through what this lady is saying she's really saying that children who've gone through care um, this is really good for society and um, their experiences should be um, uh, what's the word uh, celebrated well perhaps every child should be taken out of their home and put through the care system if it's so beneficial uh, well I think that Nicola Sturgeon actually wants this to happen but if you follow her rhetoric through she's really saying that children the role model is children role, role, are raised by the state we don't need the parents because the state is going to do it but the state is going to do it following SMP values and morality and basically if we've got the children we don't care what the parents have to say because the future's ours mm. and if you don't know where that last little uh, quote comes from this is straight out of uh, national socialism uh, when it was recognized that if children could be taken into the state via a number of programs even born into uh, a state system or Hitler youth that of course those children were the indoctrinated children of the future so the comments not demeaning in any way of children who've suffered uh, through the so-called state care system but the words we're picking up on are what uh, uh, Nicola Sturgeon is really saying. Um, well, if we're seeing a rise of uh, right-wing extremism, uh, well, we're going to deal with it, and we're going to deal with it by shutting down free speech and making sure nobody can uh, talk about what's going on in any meaningful way. Um, so here we go. If it's unacceptable offline, then it's unacceptable online. Uh, this uh, graphic has been around for a little while, but what am I pointing out here? Well, the executive board for the new UK Council for Internet Safety has been announced. Uh, now, the UK Council for Internet Safety is a successor to the UK Council for Child Internet Safety, but they've decided that uh, just dealing with uh, safety for children is not enough. They've got to expand the scope uh, to improve online safety for everyone in the UK. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, these are the organisations that are on the executive board. Uh, you can see them uh, there. We've got everyone from Apple to GCHQ to Google to the Information Commissioner, BBC. Internet Matters, the BBC and so on. Now, this organization has been established to allow these organizations to collaborate and coordinate a UK-wide approach to online safety. Uh, it will contribute to the government's commitment to make the UK the safest, safest place in the world to be online and will help to inform the development of the forthcoming Online Harms White Paper. So they're going to uh, focus on harms experienced by children, but they're going to focus on radicalization and extremism as well. And that's a very key part of it. Now, um, this is uh, what the new digital minister had to say on the subject. This is Margot James. Uh, only through collaborative action will the UK be the safest place uh, in the world to be online. Uh, and uh, so they're saying that all these groups, that, that these organizations that we've just mentioned, all these people are there to ensure that, uh, that this new organization represents the full range of online harms that the government seeks to tattle, tackle. And so I'm asking the question today, is this the new embryonic uh, regulator, the embryonic new regulator for the internet? Now Ofcom was one of the organizations on that list and Ofcom has said that they do not want to be the uh, regulator for the internet. I believe that this organization is going to morph into that regulator in the not too distant future. Uh, but whatever, whether I'm right or wrong about that, uh, this is what this is, because this is what it represents, the fusion doctrine, uh, because we're talking about, once again, Brian, the uh, collaboration between government, private sector, NGO sector, uh, and regulators. Uh, and uh, it's, dic it's dictatorship, isn't it? It is dictatorship. It's very, very sinister. And uh, what we're constantly trying to get across is the way that it's being stitched together uh, it's a secret, but it's it's done very often in an open way, as long as you know where to look for the pieces. And what we very much hope that the UK column is doing is showing people where to look. We're alerting people to how these pieces are coming together. If you want to stop it, you've got to expose it. You've got to talk 
talk about it and you've got to challenge the individuals that are putting this system together to have the BBC involved in uh, any form of censorship organization Mike is just mind-blowing 3.74 billion pounds of state propaganda censoring anybody else who dares to try and tell the truth about what's going on uh, because it doesn't but it doesn't end there because uh, here we go we're going to focus on hate even more than we have been here so it's not just offensive it's an offense apparently this is the uh, the tagline the new tagline uh, for the uh, new na nationwide hate crime campaign which is aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of what constitutes hate crime uh, and it's been launched by the government today so it's been developed in consultation with the crime prosecution service uh, and also the independent advisory group on hate crime as well as some other organizations so you can see the strap line of the campaign there it says uh, if you target anyone with verbal online or physical abuse because of their religion race sexual orientation disability or transgender identity you may be committing a hate crime uh, it's not just offensive it's an offence and as we reported a couple of weeks ago, uh, various uh, police organisations in the UK now saying that it's not, not, don't just report to us if it's something which is clearly a crime, a, a hate crime as defined in the law, uh, report to us if it's just a hate offence, you know, a bit offensive to somebody, uh, you know, you don't want to, don't worry too much about whether it's criminal or not, we will investigate no matter how uh, soft or gentle the the offense was um, so here is uh, the minister for uh, countering extremism Shirley Williams uh, and she said committing a hit crime goes against all the shared values we hold and can have a traumatic impact on victims the campaign gives clear examples of hate crime and sends a message that not only is this behavior unacceptable it's a criminal offense this is just one part of the ongoing work the government uh, of the government to tackle hate crime and ensure this sickening, sickening behavior is stamped out. Now, uh, this comes uh, apparently after police statistics are showing that 94,098 hate crimes were recorded by police in England and Wales uh, in the year to March 2018. And my question then, Brian, is, uh, is this, are, are these genuine hate crimes uh, or are these reports to police because of the pretty incessant advertising campaign that has been going on for about a year now well i've got to say mike i think it's been going on longer than that because we we certainly over the past few years have had little booklets and little leaflets sent to us that police have pushed out in various areas encouraging people to come forward if mm -hmm. they feel some sort of you know hate crime as uh, uh, has been conducted against them so more and more people encouraged to spy to report on each other and then what is the crime well the crime is what in anybody sort of decides it's going to be on that day so this is dangerous very dangerous stuff particularly when we've got a clamp down on free speech which will ultimately, ultimately mean we can't warn people about what's coming together mm hate speech we can clamp down on apparently what we can't clamp down on is child abuse and um, over the last couple of days the ICSA inquiry has been starting to turn its attention to Westminster and I have to say that um, what, what came out in a day um, where they were talking about Westminster investigation was really quite extraordinary before we comment a little bit further on that um, this is um, obviously the ICSA web page with the announcement about the inquiry and uh, looking into um, people of public prominence associated with Westminster. Uh, what caught my eye on the page was this. Uh, more details about the Westminster hearing, which is due to start Monday the 4th of March 2019. You'll notice down at the bottom it says the inquiry is encouraging all victims and survivors of child sexual abuse to share their experience. That, of course, is an absolute lie because what is what is happening is that um, victims, survivors that are coming forward are being filtered by Baroness J herself. She decides whether she wants to take evidence from this person or that person. Melanie Shaw, of course, is just one of the many who has been refused testimony. Uh, one of many, there are a lot of these people. Um, so the major lie is on ICSA's uh, 
uh, website themselves. Mm. They're encouraging people to come. Yes, they're encouraging people to come forward. Uh, they're learning what information they have. Then they're cherry picking which ones can be brought into the inquiry. To me, this smacks of a cover up. There's no doubt of this. Um, and what was said uh, in this 24 hours that they've just conducted on Westminster was that the inquiry was going to have a particular agenda for the Westminster inquiry. This to me, Mike, is that it's going to be very, very carefully managed. And uh, we know from people who are close to the inquiry that the inquiry has been wobbling, if I can use that expression, because of the amount of, of information coming forward about high profile politicians involved in abuse and the cover up of abuse. And they are not sure how they're going to whitewash this. Um, so we're going to encourage people to have a look at the material on the ICSA uh, website, have a look at the testimonies, see what they say about bringing evidence forward from MI5, security services, the Met, uh, with regard to abuses by British politicians. And I think you'll get the feeling we have, this is about managing the situation. It's not about exposing the truth and uh, bringing child abusers to book. Um, now, just uh, on this particular subject, Plymouth Live is one of the few uh, media outlets that's been co covering the trial of this uh, gentleman, former commander Charles Housen. Um, there was quite a lot of material on the Plymouth Live site. And um, recently, of course, it focused on the fact that he put in an appeal against his conviction and sentence, uh, but was basically turned down and pretty forcefully. Uh, the judges said that uh, they're left in no real doubt that the verdicts are safe. And on the evidence, we consider the verdicts were unsurprising. Just remind us what he had done. Uh, well, it was sexual assault on some young men, but this had happened over a, uh, a period of many years. There were 10 charges altogether, if I remember correctly. They were young men. Um, but uh, what we learned as the evidence came forward is that no action was taken. No action was taken by the charity Groundwork Trust that he was involved with. And of particular interest to me, no action was taken by the Royal Navy. In fact, some of the testimony that came into the court hearing suggested that there had been a cover up and reports censoring Mr. Housen were never uh, put in front of him. Some very, very strange evidence came forward. And of course, we remember in this trial that witness after witness, high profile witnesses, uh, character witnesses, that is, um, former uh, senior military officers, uh, former MPs, former council people, all stepped forward to say that Mr. Halson couldn't possibly have committed these crimes because he was such an upstanding pillar of society. So um, this has been a fascinating case, not reported uh, really at all in any of the national press and media. Uh, we're really not sure why, but we do wonder whether possibly that's got something to do with his connections to the royal family. And I'll end on the note of saying that uh, this has been a particularly difficult time for me because I served on board a ship with uh, Mr. Housen, HMS Cleopatra, and uh, uh, there was no uh, follow up to show that he'd committed any offence at all. All of this has come to light in uh, recent years. And of course, he was such a powerhouse in the Plymouth business community that there was virtually nobody in Plymouth who didn't come into contact with Mr. Housen in one way or another. Um, so while the trial has been going on, and even while that appeal has been formulated, uh, I certainly haven't been able to speak. Um, but I'm making this statement so that those people who are pointing fingers should understand how difficult uh, it's been and what a good job Devon and Cornwall Police did to actually finally bring this man to book. Mm. Adverts, uh, remember that we've got the um, vaccine uh, conference coming up. Um, this is on Sunday, the 11th of November. Now, we have got a venue for that because it's going to be at the Tabernacle, Notting Hill, London W11 2A1. Uh, 
why Christi Christina England has put this together and put a huge amount of work into doing so. So if you can get to that event, I'm sure that it will be absolutely fascinating, huge amount of information, and you will be supporting getting the truth out about vaccines. Uh, we should end on uh, advert free and cranes AV 9.1, Sunday the 2nd of December 2018. And um, that is going to be talking about democracy in chains, which, uh, of course, we've essentially followed in the news. And I'm sorry, I nearly missed one. Uh, we've also got an event uh, coming up. Um, that's this Sunday, the 4th of uh, November, Maxilla Social Club, uh, which is 4 Maxilla Walk W106NQ. Uh, this is a talk put together on the Chartist movement, which will be talking about money. It will also be talking about common law. Uh, there's the link to the website. And uh, sorry, that should be... That uh, should be newchartistmovement.org. Um, so if you go to the website, you can see the full details for that talk. That's it for us today. Remember, if you're unhappy with what's going on, it's no good sitting listening to us. Please do your own research. Please get out there warning friends, families and others as to what is happening in Britain in 2018. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye bye.